Good evening viewers and aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis brought to you by Shankar Ice Academy. Today we are going to cover the Hindi News edition dated 6th of June 2022. I have taken these news articles for discussion today and at the end as usual I also have a quiz question for you. So pay attention to all the discussions. Without wasting much time let us get to the first news article discussion. So first discussion for today is going to be based on this news article. This is an important article from the biodiversity and conservation point of view. The article mentions that world's first fishing cat census has been done in the Chilika Lake. So before knowing about the census details, let us see few facts about this fishing cat. See the name of the species says as cat because as you can see in these images it looks like a cat only and in this side posture particularly this species even resembles a cheetah. This is maybe because the fishing cat is a feline species. But note that it is twice the size of a typical house cat. So let us see some of the features and characteristics of the species. See first it has a powerful built and stocky legs. Stocky legs means a heavily built leg. And more importantly fishing cat is an adept swimmer and it enters water frequently to prey on fish. It is even known to dive to catch fish. This is why this feline species is called fishing cat. So it has extraordinary hunting abilities. From this we can understand that fish forms a major part of fishing cat's diet. Apart from fish it also preys on frogs, crustaceans, snakes, birds and it even scavenges on carcasses of larger animals. But just now we said that it is an adept swimmer. How? It is because it has certain specialized features like it has you know partially webbed feet and it also has a water resistant fur. So due to these the species is able to thrive in wetlands such as marshlands, mangroves and flooded forests. Actually wetlands are the favorite habitats of fishing cat. Another characteristic that you need to know is this species is nocturnal that is it is active in night. Now where this species is found? It is widely distributed in South and Southeast Asia. You can find it from Pakistan in the West to Cambodia in the East and uh, from the Himalayan foothills in the North to the Sri Lanka and Peninsula Thailand in South. So throughout South and Southeast Asia it is found majorly around the river basins because just now we saw it prefers wetlands. Preferring wetland is also a reason for this species distribution to be patchy. Because wetlands are not spread throughout a country, right? They are only found in certain countries. So it is found in uh, countries having wetlands. This includes Bangladesh, Cambodia, India, Myanmar, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Thailand. But it is said that the species has remained undetected since the last decade in two places. These two places are Vietnam and then the Java island of Indonesia. So previously it was found in Vietnam and Java but now in the last decade it could not be found. Now what about in India? It is found in the mangrove forests of the Sundarbans, on the foothills of Himalayas along the Ganga and Brahmaputra river valleys and it is also found in the western Ghats. So in India it is uh, found in the protected areas like you know Dudwa uh, Tiger Reserve and Sur Sarovar Bird Sanctuary in Uttar Pradesh, then Corbett Tiger Reserve, then Kaziranga and Manas Tiger Reserves in Assam. Like this it has been found in all these protected areas. You can just take note of it. Apart from these protected areas, they are also found outside the protected areas. For example, they have been found in the Philibit Forest Division in Uttar Pradesh, then in some uh, districts of West Bengal. They are found along the you know, uh, Krishna River mangroves in Andhra Pradesh. Particularly, they are also found in human-dominated northeastern part of Chilika Lake. Actually, in Chilika Lake, a viable population was found few years ago and that is why now a census has been conducted there. So, in all these places, fishing cat naturally occurs. It occurs naturally in both the protected areas and also outside the protected areas. And we can also understand the association of fishing cat with wetlands. So wetlands are important for the survival of fishing cat. And this is why the destruction of wetlands is one of the major threats faced by this species. Now this destruction happens due to many reasons. For example, due to human settlements, due to the drainage from agriculture, then the pollution and also due to the deforestation and wood cutting. There is also another threat which is the depletion of its main prey fish 
and this happens due to unsustainable fishing practices by the fishing communities and then occasionally also this species is poached for its skin and also for its meat so these are some of the common threats faced by this species now due to these threats conservation becomes important and as a part of this only fishing cat is listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list Apart from this, even sites that is Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species has listed the species under its Appendix 2. Then what about India? India also protects the species under Schedule 1 Part 1 of Indian Wildlife Protection Act. And due to this, in India, it is protected from hunting. So these are the basic facts that you need to know about fishing cat. Now if we come to the census, as we saw in the beginning, this is the world's first population estimation of the fishing cat outside the protected areas. And this was conducted by the Chilika Development Authority in collaboration with another organization called Fishing Cat Project. Now the main purpose behind the census is twofold. First is to know the extent of the species, that is to know where it is found, uh, that is to know how much of these species is surviving in Chilika. And also this census helps as an indication of what might be happening to the wetland ecosystems because if regularly the census is conducted and if we could find that the fishing cat uh, population is declining or increasing then based on that we can say whether wetland ecosystems like Chilika Lake are surviving or being disrupted. So from this discussion we can easily say that fishing cat is one of the species that can be associated with wetland health. Now, from the findings of the census, it could be found that Chilika Lake has 176 fishing cats. Now, in the next census, we'll know whether the population of fishing cats has declined or increased. Based on that, we can assess the health of the Chilika Lake. So, these are few facts that you need to know about uh, fishing cats. Now, let us move on to the next discussion. So, our second discussion for today is going to be based on this news article. See, it is also an environment-based article which talks about the findings of an important report called as State of Environment Report of 2022. Mainly, the article talks about the level of pollution of rivers in India based on the findings of this report. So, let us see what are these findings. Before that, you should note that this State of Environment Report is an annual publication it is published by Center for Science and Environment and Down to Earth. See, the Center for Science and Environment is a public interest research and advocacy organization that is based in New Delhi. And then this Down to Earth is a fortnightly magazine that focuses on politics of environment and development. It is also published in New Delhi. So how these two are related? The Center for uh, Science and Environment actually assists in the production of this magazine. So overall, these two organizations focus on climate change, migration, health and food systems. And this is one of the important reports that talks about the health of the environment. Basically, the report covers uh, biodiversity, forest and wildlife, energy, industry, habitat, pollution, waste, agriculture and rural development. And the 2022 report is the ninth annual edition of this report. But note that it is not uh, available publicly. So we are going to see some of the findings related to the conditions of river that has been noted by the report. See, first of all, regarding the condition of rivers, the report talks about heavy toxic metal pollution. So what are heavy metals? Generally, it is defined as those metals that have high atomic number, atomic weight and a greater density. And these heavy metals normally occur in nature and they are essential to life, but they can also become toxic through accumulation in organisms. So this is the generally used definition of heavy metals. Other than this, several other definitions also exist. Now, with respect to India, the Central Water Commission has a definition. According to this, the term heavy metal refers to any metal and metalloid element that has a relatively high density ranging from 3.5 to 7 grams per centimeter cube. And such a metal and metalloid element is toxic or poisonous at low concentrations. So these two are the essential features of heavy metal according to the definition of CWC. Therefore, it includes majorly nine heavy metals. They are mercury, cadmium, arsenic, chromium, thallium, zinc, nickel, copper and lead. See, as you know, many of these have direct toxic effects on human health and that is why they are also referred to as heavy toxic metals. So, this is the Indian definition. Even though we have this definition, 
the world health organization in 2011 has listed some more heavy metals in addition to these which are toxic generally and these includes these nine metals plus beryllium aluminum manganese iron cobalt selenium molybdenum silver tin antimony and barium so all these come under the definition of heavy metals nationally and internationally now the main issue with heavy metals is they are discharged into water especially river system by natural or anthropogenic sources and they are also not removed from water as a result of self purification rather they accumulate in water systems and they enter the food chain and thus they become toxic to humans now the report of 2022 has certain findings regarding heavy toxic metals it notes that 3 out of every 4 river monitoring stations in india have recorded alarming levels of heavy toxic metals these includes the presence of lead iron nickel cadmium arsenic chromium and copper the report also found that in about 1/4 of the stations high levels of two or more toxic metals were reported see the problem here is that these 1/4 of the stations are spread across 117 rivers and tributaries that means around 117 rivers and its tributaries they have high levels of two or more toxic metals particularly if you take Ganga the report has found that in 10 out of 33 monitoring stations on the Ganga there were high levels of contaminants and these contaminants include lead iron nickel cadmium and arsenic so we can say that these contaminations were found in Ganga so the first finding was regarding the heavy toxic metal pollution now the second one which the report focuses on is about the total coliform and biochemical oxygen demand of waters or the rivers So here total coliform includes the bacteria that are found in the soil and which are found in the water that has been influenced by surface water then the bacteria which are found in human and animal waste now the problem is if this coliform bacteria is present in drinking water then the risk of contracting water borne disease is increased and generally a positive total coliform sample is considered as an indication of pollution also so in this way the total coliforms help us in assessing the bacteriological quality of water then what about biochemical oxygen demand in short bod see it is the measure of the amount of oxygen that is required by microorganisms to degrade organic matter now this biochemical oxygen demand is actually indicative of the organic pollutants in the water so high value of bod suggests that oxygen that is present in water is consumed by the aerobic bacteria so that oxygen is not available to the other aquatic species like fishes so it makes the survival of these aquatic species difficult so what you need to understand is the high level of bod are good indicators of organic pollution level in the water so here the chain is like this you know uh, the more organic matter there is the greater the bod and when there is greater bod then there is lower amount of dissolved oxygen available for aquatic animals and then this in turn results in the death of aquatic species now why this uh, bod increases its high level could be a result of uh, many things like dumping of uh, municipal waste etc so basically the increased level of total coliform and bod is an indicator of poor wastewater treatment from industry agriculture and domestic households so what are the findings regarding uh, these two in this report the report found that the total coliform and bod was high in 239 and 88 stations respectively and these were spread across 21 states so you can say that 21 states have high levels of total coliform and bod and this means people across these 21 states are susceptible to water borne diseases and it also affects the life of aquatic species the report also found that this is due to the fact india dumps 72 percentage of its sewage without treatment see already the central pollution control board data suggests that almost 10 states do not treat their sewage at all so you can understand the level of pollution that exists in the rivers of those states So these are the main findings of this 2022 state of environment report. These data will be helpful for you to enrich your answer in your mains. Okay, now let us move on to the next discussion. So our next discussion is going to be based on this news article. It talks about a project to track small fishing vessels. 
See, this project is in use because the quad grouping is looking to track and address illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing in the Indo-Pacific. See, this illegal, unreported and unregulated, in short, is called as IUU fishing. Now, to address this IUU fishing, the quad grouping is taking an ambitious effort to install the satellite-based vehicle monitoring system. It is still in the planning stage, but the satellite-based vehicle monitoring system is yet to be rolled out. And this will be applicable for small fishing vessels, uh, which are less than 20 meters. An implementing of this system is planned across India's coastline, but its implementation remains stuck. And that is why now the quad grouping is pushing to install this satellite-based vehicle monitoring system. Based on this, let us understand the impacts of IUU fishing and we'll also see some of the agreements that govern such IUU fishing. As I said, IUU stands for Illegal, Unreported and Unregulated Fishing. So it remains one of the greatest threats to marine ecosystems. This is because first it undermines the national and regional efforts to manage fisheries sustainably. Second, it also undermines the endeavors to conserve marine biodiversity. And also it takes advantage of corrupt administration and it exploits weak management regimes. Particularly, this IUU fishing is practiced in developing countries because they generally lack the capacity and resources for effective monitoring, control and surveillance of fishing. Now you should note that this IUU fishing is found in all types and dimensions of fisheries. It occurs uh, both on the high seas and in areas with national jurisdiction also. It also concerns all aspects and stages of capture and utilization of fish. So that means just fishing is not only included in this IUU fishing, but selling them to market is also included in IUU fishing. And sometimes it is associated with organized crime also. Now, the major impact of such IUU fishing is that it removes the fisheries resources that are available to bona fide fishers. That is, the legitimate fishers do not get the resources. This leads to collapse of local fisheries because small-scale fisheries in developing countries are proving to be particularly vulnerable. This is due to the fact that the products that are got from this IUU fishing, they find their way into overseas trade markets also. So this restrains not only local food supply, but it also affects their exports. Therefore, this IUU fishing threatens livelihoods, it exacerbates poverty, and it also augments food insecurity. Now, to address this issue, the Quad Grouping came up with an initiative. As you know, Quad Grouping uh, comprises of India, Australia, Japan, and the USA. That is four countries. And they announced IPMDA initiative at the Tokyo Summit. This IPMDA stands for Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative. This initiative has two objectives. First, it will track dark shipping. Now, what is this dark shipping? See, these dark ships enable IUU fishing. Let us see how. See, these dark ships are the vessels which have their automatic identification system switched off. So, this makes the vessels undetectable. What is this automatic identification system? It is a transponder system. When we say transponder, it refers to a device that is used for receiving a radio signal and automatically transmitting a different signal. Okay, now this automatic identification systems that are used in vessels, they are the transponders which are designed to be capable of providing position, identification and other information about the ship to other ships. And it also provides this information to coastal authorities automatically. In short, this AIS is like an automated uh, tracking system that displays other vessels in the vicinity. And it also helps the coastal authorities to know which are all the vessels in the waters. Now, when this is turned off, it enables such vessels to carry out fishing and thus it becomes unregulated and illegal. And such kinds of ships are called as dark ships. So, one of the objectives of uh, Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative is to track the dark shipping. Now, second, this initiative will also be used to build a faster, wider and more accurate maritime picture of near real-time activities in partners' waters. So, such real-time data will also help to curtail dark ships and IUU fishing. So, for this initiative, three critical regions in Indo-Pacific has been integrated. They are the Pacific Islands, Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean region. So, India is a part of this initiative. Now, apart from this initiative, there are also two main regulations that are functioning internationally on IUU fishing. They are the Cape Town Agreement and the Agreement on Ports State Measures. 
First, let us see about the Cape Town Agreement. It is an internationally binding instrument that was framed in the year 2012. This agreement sets minimum requirements on the design, construction, equipment and inspection of fishing vessels. And this agreement applies to the fishing vessels which are of the size of 24 meters in length and over or the vessels having equivalent in terms of gross tons. In this manner, the agreement includes mandatory international requirements for stability and associated seaworthiness. It also includes uh, international requirements for uh, machinery and electrical installations, life-saving appliances, communications equipment and fire protection. It also includes requirements for fishing vessel construction also. So overall, it provides a basis for you know how a fishing vessel should be. See, such kinds of regulations and agreements are important because, for example, if you assume already India and Sri Lanka, they are fighting over fishing grounds. And this is mainly because Indian fishermen, they are using bottom trawling fishing vessels. And this bottom trawling, they coop out marine resources in one go. So this easily depletes the fish, prawns and other marine resources in the ocean. And that is why this is opposed by Sri Lankan government. Now, if for example, if this agreement bans the use of bottom trawling vessels, then it could not be used by any country which are signatory to it. So in this manner, the minimum requirements regarding the fishing vessels design, construction, equipment and also inspection is required. And this is set by the Cape Town Agreement of 2012. Now next comes the Agreement on Ports State Measures. See, note that this is the first binding international agreement to specifically target illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing, that is IUU fishing. So its uh, primary objective is to prevent, deter and eliminate IUU fishing. And this will be done by preventing vessels which are engaged in IUU fishing from using the ports and by preventing them from landing their catches. So in this way, this agreement reduces the incentive of uh, such uh, IUU fishing vessels which otherwise operate. Along with this, the agreement also blocks fisheries products which are derived from IUU fishing from reaching uh, national markets and international markets. So we can say that the effective implementation of this agreement ultimately contributes to the long-term conservation and sustainable use of living marine resources and marine ecosystems. And note that the provisions of this agreement apply to the fishing vessels which seek entry into the designated port of a state and which is having a different flag to the flag of that state. But the issue is, you know, both these agreements does not apply to India because India is not a signatory to both these agreements. And that is why India is also pushing for the Quad Initiative of Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness because this will help India to track the dark ships and to curtail the IUU fishing. So in this discussion, we saw few factors of IUU fishing and its impacts. We also saw some of the regulations or the agreements that deal with them. Now let us go on to the next discussion. So our next discussion is going to be based on this text and context article here. The article mentions that the Indian Union Civil Aviation Minister has said that the government of India is exploring the possibility of inviting manufacturers of EV toll aircraft to set up base in India. So what is this EV toll? It stands for Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing Aircraft. The article also mentions that several eVTOL players are keen on setting up production centers in India. So based on this, the article talks about the development of eVTOL, the challenges faced in the sector and also the position of India in it. Let us see all these aspects today. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. If you remember, we already discussed about eVTOL some days before on our May 22nd Hindi News Analysis. On that day, we saw about uh, what eVTOL is and what led to the innovation. So I suggest to the viewers to view that analysis for a better understanding of eVTOL. Today, we'll just brush up what is that and we'll see the progress made in this innovation and the challenges related to it in detail. See, basically eVTOL, which stands for Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing, is an aircraft and it is an aircraft that uses electric power to hover, take off and land vertically. This type of aircraft uses distributed electric propulsion technology, which means it integrates the complex propulsion system with the airframe. Some even describe eVTOL as being a runway independent technological solution for the globe's transportation needs. Some sources say there are an estimated 250 eVTOL concepts and more are being fine-tuned to bring alive the concept of urban air mobility. 
So remember, eVTOL is an innovation that is used in the concept of urban air mobility. So some of the common concepts used are multi-rotors, fixed wing and tilt wing concepts, which are backed by sensors, cameras, and even radar. And based on this, it is said that eVTOL is a third wave in an aerial revolution. What was the first wave then? The first one was the advent of commercial flying and the second wave was the age of helicopters. And the third wave is the revolution caused by eVTOLs. With this basic understanding, now let us see the background about eVTOLs. See, according to the article, there is a general agreement that eVTOL world is moving forward based on the spark provided by NASA researcher Mark D. Moore. This NASA researcher came up with the concept of a personal air vehicle. And under this concept, he created a personal air vehicle called Puffin. And even a prototype was unveiled in the year 2010. And from this stage, so many developments have been made in eVTOL. For example, Electric VTOL News has even created a world eVTOL aircraft directory. See, this Electric VTOL News is a published uh, vertical flight society and it is world's longest serving and largest VTOL technical organization. So it has created a world eVTOL aircraft directory and now it has also categorized almost uh, all known electric and hybrid eVTOL concepts. There are many categories here. I'm just going to give a brief about these categories. You just know these names. We are not going to go in deep about these categories. The first category is vectored thrust. This is the category where any thruster is used for lift and cruise. Then next category is the hover bikes, which is also called as personal flying devices. These are single person eVTOL aircraft and they are used in multi-copter type wingless configurations. Next type is lift and cruise. In this category, independent thrusters are used for cruise and lift without any thrust vectoring. And next comes the wingless multicopter. Here there is no thruster for cruise but only for lift. And then comes the electric rotor craft which is called as eVTOLs. These use a rotor such as an electric helicopter or autogyro. Okay, so these are the common categories. Apart from this, developments were also made taking into account the effective functioning of eVTOLs. For example, the roles of eVTOLs depends on battery technology and the limits of onboard electric power. See, electric power is needed during all the key phases of a flight. For example, during takeoff, landing and even during flight. This includes uh, flight during high wind conditions also. Along with this, there is also an important factor of weight. So keeping this in mind, companies are looking at various formats of technology to overcome the limits of onboard electric power. For example, they are looking into using variety of lithium batteries. Then they are also looking into using diamond nuclear voltaic technology, which is called as DNV technology. See, this technology uses minute amounts of carbon-14 nuclear waste, which are encased in layered industrial diamonds. These create self-charging batteries. So this technology is also looked into for enhancing the electric power on board. Apart from this, there are also some industry experts who are looking at hybrid technologies such as hydrogen cells and batteries depending on the flight mission. Then experts are also thinking about the use of gas powered generator. This gas powered generator will power a small aircraft engine. This in turn will charge the battery system. So like this, various formats of uh, battery technology is being looked into. And as a result of all these developments, many industries have made designs of eVTOLs. If you take the important uh, industries that are into this business, it includes uh, Volocopter VC1 from Germany. Then you have the Open Black Fly from the US. Then we have Airbus and Boeing also. For example, if you take Airbus, it already unveiled a prototype eVTOL in 2017. This is called as Vahana Alpha 1 or the Airbus Vahana. This prototype was considered as a cost comparable replacement for short range urban transportation. So from this we can easily say that it is a transport used for a shorter distance and this is uh, based on a design called fan run tilt wing design. After this Airbus Vahana, the company itself then shifted to another type called as City Airbus project. Under this only the air taxi was created. This air taxi or city airbus has uh, propellers and direct drive electric motors. So these are some of the advancements or developments in the eVTOL field. But along with these developments, there are also many challenges that needs attention. What are these challenges? So the first challenge is due to the fact that the technology so far is a mix of 
unpiloted aircraft and piloted aircraft so more attention is needed for crash prevention systems see generally these crash prevention systems use cameras radars gps and infrared scanners to prevent any crash and collision so full proof crash prevention system is needed apart from this there are also issues such as ensuring safety in case of power plant or uh, safety in case of rotor failure etc then there is also a challenge with respect to cyber attacks because such cyber attacks can affect the aircraft protection so this area needs to be explored and proper protection systems should be put in place then another area of focus should be on the navigation and flight safety and the use of technology when operating in difficult terrain or unsafe operating environments and operating during bad weathers because these affect the normal flight of the aircraft so in all these challenges innovation is needed such innovation could be achieved through further research into the technology so now what is evtol's position in india as you already saw the union avian minister has asked the companies in the sector to look at the indian market now this is because evtols are crucial for india this is due to the features of evtols like you know they are being noise free they have zero carbon footprint and particularly they are also more affordable so looking at the interest of indian government and the uh, businesses in the evtol the experts and businesses have advised the regulatory authorities in india to look at crucial matters so that evtol can flourish in india for this they have provided certain suggestions first suggestion is formulating regulations for pilotless vehicles then regulations for airworthiness certifications and then regulations that are needed for a pilot's license next suggestion is implementing efficient energy management systems then onboard sensors collision detection systems and advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence another suggestion is establishing infrastructural support such as verti ports what is a verti port it is an area of land water or structure that is used or intended to be used for the landing and take off of evtol aircraft so we can in short say verti port is the airport for evtols and such infrastructural support should also include parking lots and charging stations in addition to this creating a robust air traffic management system is also suggested such a air traffic management system should be integrated with other modes of transportation so this also forms a crucial part of crash prevention because if you take the aeroplanes we have air traffic control to regulate the aircrafts and their movement like that we need a robust air traffic management system for evtols also so that collision and crashing could be avoided and finally a database should be put in place to ensure operational and mechanical safety so these suggestions have been given to have a robust evtol sector in our country now apart from all these there are also psychological barriers which need to be overcome because this evtol is going to be a fully autonomous aircraft so people should be psychologically prepared to fly in such a fully autonomous aircraft see people are worried to you know travel in tesla which has a autopilot mode then you think about an aircraft that is flying on an autopilot mode from the start till the end it is not something easy so for this psychologically people should also prepare themselves and this could be done by establishing proper guidelines for evtol operations so that mistakes could be avoided and eliminated so these are few facts that you can take from the text in context article i know this article is quite technical you just go through this discussion and know that these are present in a evtol technology we'll know more about it when india creates a robust evtol sector and the technologies that will be used by the indian evtol sector at that time so with these points in mind now let us get to the next discussion Now let us take up this news article for discussion. The article talks about an observation made by the Delhi High Court. See, the High Court has observed that religious conversion is not prohibited unless it is forced. Now, this observation has raised a question of whether proselytism is also protected under the right to religious freedom in the Constitution. So, to understand the article, let us see what is this proselytism, how it is related to the concept of religious conversion. then supreme court's observation on this matter we'll also see some of the recommendations of the law commission on this issue the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference so first let us understand the term proselytism so you may think this is a new word but it is not because 
it refers to the practice of inducing someone to convert to one's faith or we can say that it is recruiting someone to join one's party institution or cause or a faith so proselytism would mean you know forced conversion but just now we saw that delhi high court has noted that religious conversion is not prohibited if it is not forced so it is prohibited when it is forced and this observation has been made by the delhi high court for a petition which talks about framing of laws to prohibit conversions by force or by deception the case is still going on so the final verdict will give us a clear picture based on this let us know what our constitution says about religious freedom see here we are mainly talking about article 25 because this article talks about the freedom of conscience and free profession practice and propagation of religion see according to this article all persons are equally entitled to the freedom of conscience and they have the equal right to freely profess practice and propagate their religion but note that such a freedom is subject to public order morality and health now based on this article supreme court has made several observations and interpretations of this article and uh, it has noted that no person shall force their religious beliefs consequently no person should also be forced to practice any religion against their wishes but you have to remember constitution does not explicitly say so these are the interpretations of the supreme court along with this there is also no central legislation that restricts or regulates religious conversions and this is the issue here and this issue is what is dealt by delhi high court because the petition that has been filed in the high court challenges mass conversions so again here the delhi high court has noted if the religious conversion is not forced then it is not prohibited now with respect to supreme court we need to know about two important uh, judgments one judgment was made in the year 1977 in the case law reverend stainis clause versus state of madhya pradesh in this case law supreme court held that the word propagate in article 25 does not give the right to convert another person to one's own religion under pressure or inducement so here supreme court clarified that the term propagate only gives the right to spread one's religion or the right to communicate the religious beliefs to others by an exposition of its tenets what do you mean by exposition of tenets it means providing a comprehensive description and explanation of an idea or theory that is believed to be true so that means you can propagate your religion but you cannot force someone to convert to your religion and if based on the tenets of a religion which has been propagated and a person feels that they can attain spirituality in that religion then they can convert to that religion but here you cannot simply ask a person to convert to your religion you can only propagate in addition to this supreme court also held that there was no fundamental right to convert another person to one's own religion so note that converting a person to one's own religion is not a fundamental right this is because according to supreme court's observation if a person purposely undertakes conversion of another then that would impinge on the freedom of conscience guaranteed to all citizens of the country so these are the observations made by the supreme court in the 1977 case law and recently also we had a important case that dealt with religious conversion yes you are right it is the hardia judgment of 2017 In this judgment Supreme Court said that the conversion to any religion is one's own choice. It particularly noted that the matters of dress, the matters of food, of ideas and of ideologies, of love and partnership all are within the central aspects of identity. Therefore, neither the state nor the law can dictate a choice of partner or limit the free ability of every person to decide on these matters. That is on the matters of dress, food, ideas and ideologies, love and partnership. So finally in this judgment only Supreme Court held that the right to marry a person of one's choice is integral to article 21 of Indian constitution which deals with protection of life and personal liberty So here you should note that Supreme Court not only held that it is our right to marry a person of our own choice but it also held that conversion to any one's religion is one's own choice But still we can understand that these judgments are incomplete in some sense because supreme court did not say what would amount to forced conversion and which are all will be considered as converting by own choice etc etc so this creates lot of loopholes 
and it becomes a issue why because we know most of conversions happen due to marriage also and when this happens due to marriage it is often alleged that it is a forced conversion so supreme court should provide a clarity on this subject but already the law commission of india has recommended certain steps that need to be taken if one converts or reconverts after marriage this was recommended by the law commission of india to stop all false allegations so what are the steps first the converted person if she or he chooses then they can send a declaration to the officer in charge of registration of marriages in the concerned area and this is to be done within a month after the date of conversion now such a declaration should contain the requisite details which will include you know the particulars of the convert such as uh, date of birth their permanent address the present place of residence their uh, husband's name or father's name then it should also contain the religion to which the convert originally belonged to and the religion to which they are preferring to convert they should also mention the date and place of conversion and the nature of process gone through for conversion so the declaration should contain all these details now after the declaration is sent to the officer in charge of registration of marriages then the official should exhibit a copy of this declaration on the notice board of the office till the date of confirmation of such conversion now this is put up in the notice board because if anyone wants to you know contest or challenge such a conversion they can challenge it now after that the converted individual can appear before the registering officer and they can establish their identity and confirm the contents of the declaration now when this is done the registering officer has to record the facts of declaration and confirm the conversion in a register maintained for this purpose and if there is any objections then they have to record those also along with the name and particulars of the objector and the nature of objection and this has to be done within 21 days from the date of uh, sending or filing the declaration when all of this is done certified copies of declaration then confirmation and the extracts from the register shall be furnished to the party that is the party who has given the declaration or the authorized legal representative of that person now from these steps itself you can easily say that if someone is forced to convert they can register at any point that this is a forced conversion so these steps have already been stipulated by the law commission of india and these are being followed by the officers that deal with marriages now let us wait and see what the delhi high court rules in the matter of uh, religious conversion and whether supreme court takes up this matter or not these are few points that you have to take note about the topic of religious conversion and proselytism so with this discussion we have come to the last session where we are going to discuss some practice questions let us take up the first question it is a two statement question the first statement is state of environment report is released by the union ministry of environment forest and climate change this is incorrect the discussion itself we saw that it is released by center for science and environment along with down to earth so one should not be in the answer because the question asks for the correct statements now let us come to the statement 2 According to 2022 state of environment report high levels of lead iron nickel cadmium and arsenic are found in river ganga see if you do not know about the findings of 2020 report then it is always safe to leave such kinds of question or you can also assume that these are uh, high toxic metals that are often found in rivers actually this statement is correct we saw this during discussion these were the five high toxic metals that were found in river ganga so the correct answer to this question is option b two only now let us take up the next question consider the following statements statement 1 agreement on ports state measures is an indian agreement statement 2 india is a member of cape town agreement since december 2019 statement 3 iuu fishing threatens livelihoods exacerbates poverty and augments food security so when there is a question like this this is the best question to implement elimination technique because you may not have heard about the agreements mentioned in statement 1 and 2 but you definitely know about statement 3 and for that you should know what is iuu fishing it stands for illegal unreported and unregulated fishing if you know the full form itself we can assume that it threatens livelihood exacerbates poverty and augments food insecurity so statement 3 is actually correct but if you see the question asks us to choose incorrect statements so 3 should not be in the answer you can eliminate options b c and d so the correct answer is option a 1 and 2 only both these statements are incorrect let us see why 
statement one is incorrect because this agreement is an international agreement that specifically targets iuu fishing and it is a binding agreement and not an indian agreement and statement two is incorrect because india is not a signatory to both these agreements now let's take up the next question which of the following are major impacts of river pollution statement one aquatic species go extinct or move to other water bodies Statement 2 contamination of edible fish with harmful microbes statement 3 increased disease burden statement 4 loss of export revenue see this is one such question where you can answer even if you do not have any idea about this topic you just need general knowledge about river pollution the correct answer to this question is option d all of these are major impacts of river pollution let us see how See river pollution affects humans as well as flora and fauna especially the chemical effluents and sewage which pollute indian river they cause several species of aquatic life to go extinct or it makes those aquatic life to move away to safer havens and this has a direct impact on wildlife conservation efforts that are taken by central and state governments plus the river contamination also threatens biospheres and natural conservation areas a uh, migratory birds are also affected and the flora and fauna are affected because their habitat is threatened now next it also causes loss of livelihood because the fishermen and fish farms which depend on these indian rivers they find it increasingly difficult to find sufficient catch of edible fish and during discussion itself we saw that the rivers are polluted with high toxic metals so the fish in such rivers are unfit for human consumption so they cannot be sold by the fishermen and also even the edible fish is contaminated with microbes such as salmonella shigella and others so they also become unfit for human consumption and then river pollution also causes loss of drinking water as you know according to some estimation over 800 million indians are severely stressed for potable water due to river water pollution and then river pollution also affects agriculture because polluted water does not allow seeds to germinate and it also causes stunted growth of crops and then definitely it impacts the disease and health burden of a country so generally in these polluted rivers if you bath it leads to skin diseases allergies and other such ailments and even consuming such polluted water will lead to many other uh, health ailments such as cancer depletion of calcium from bones it leads to loss of vision etc and it leads to disease burden because majority of indians especially those below the poverty line they depend on state sponsored healthcare system because that is the one which is readily available for them and which is affordable to them and these are the people who rely on contaminated river waters for their day to day requirements so they are the one who are directly affected and because of this the health and disease burden of a state and country increases and it becomes burdened and finally there is also loss of export revenue see for example the fresh water fish varieties such as uh, famous hilsa rohu katla and prawns from indian rivers once had a high demand in foreign countries especially they were demanded in the middle east but due to the water pollution many of these prized fish get contaminated with disease causing microbes and chemicals so due to this many countries have banned imports of fresh water fish from india so this has caused severe loss of export revenue for india so all these are impacts of river pollution and that is why the correct answer is option d now along with this i also have this quiz question for you today read the statement carefully and try to arrive at the correct answer you can post the answer in the comment section i'll tell you whether your answer is right or not so with this prelims question i also have two mains questions for you today the mains is fast approaching so develop the habit of writing so that you'll have more points in the actual examination hall interested aspirants can write answers to these questions and also post those answers in the comment section so with this we have come to the end of hindi news analysis for the date 6th of june 2022 if you like this video don't forget to like comment and share and also subscribe to shankar is academy youtube channel for receiving regular updates thank you